Kidneys are vital organs with important jobs. They clean our blood, separate waste, and remove extra fluid, but problems can arise. Hi, this is Dr. Lenore Coleman, president and founder of Healing Our Village, and this is our weekly episode called For Your Health. You know, we're here to try to give you really detailed information about the various chronic diseases that can affect your, your, your body and your mental health. Um, as you know, we focus a lot on diabetes and diabetes complications like kidney disease, eye disease, um, there's nerve disease. Diabetes actually starts to, to affect your body one part at a time. And so we're trying to really focus on these complications because, you know, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in this country. And if, if you go into dialysis centers anywhere in this country, the people that are in there, a lot of them are African American. And we also know that the reason they're there is because of their high blood pressure and their high blood sugars. So diabetes and hypertension is why we're having this chronic kidney disease. And so I'm here today to talk to you about that. Um, this is actually kidney month, so that's the other reason that we're focusing on yeah. chronic kidney disease. And we are so honored and privileged to have with us today, Dr. James Hall. And Dr. James Hall is actually in Brookhaven, Mississippi. So, Dr. Hall, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for inviting me. Excellent, excellent. Listen, tell us a little bit about yourself. We want to know where you went to school, um, what made you decide to do kid, become a nephrologist, uh, and a little bit about your clinic there that you have. Well, I'm from Magnolia, Mississippi. I attended college at University of Southern Mississippi. Brett Favre, our claim to fame for Southern Mississippi, was a senior when I was a freshman in okay. college. And from there, I went to medical school at University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. And that's where I did all of my training, my, my medical school, residency, and my nephrology fellowship. Okay. The main reason I went into nephrology was because there were so many. Initially, I wanted to do cardiology. But there was so much time and commitment to a field in cardiology. However, nephrology was a lot less time consuming. Yes. And I really liked the patient demographic. Yes. There are a lot of African Americans in that area and arena. And that's why I really wanted to kind of jump in and see where I could benefit my patients and my constituents. And so that's why I went into nephrology. And I feel like it was a great choice. I've, I've been rewarded greatly by going in this field, not just monetary, but also just helping my own people. Okay. All right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So as I told, as I said, as a, my start in, this is chronic kidney month, right? So you're here today right. to talk to us about everything I need to know about chronic kidney disease for our audience. And so we really can do a better job of getting people to maybe prevent, you know, coming to, right. to, to right. see you because they need dialysis for sure. <laughs> So tell us what exactly right. is chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is a, a gradual loss of your kidney function. Usually, you know, your kidneys basically filter toxins out of your blood uh, and, you know, medication that you take, foods that you eat, or things that you consume. Sometimes some of the byproducts can build up in your system. And kidneys actually filter all that out and get rid of it in the form of urine. Okay. So that's why a lot of times your urine can tell you what's going on with your body based on what color it is. So that's kind of what your kidneys do. Any loss of that function, you call kidney chronic kidney disease is what we call it when you lose any level of kidney function. 
I got you. I got you. Now, the reason why I got into this business of trying to heal the village is because I know that African Americans are just predisposed to so many different things. We call those things health disparities. So why, right. why do you think that African Americans have higher rates of kidney disease? You know, this is a multifactorial answer, and there are a lot of reasons. In short, you know, blacks are somewhat predisposed to the effects of kidney disease from a genetic perspective. For instance, certain genetic variations uh, of people from Western Africa will predispose you to developing kidney disease. Um, blacks have a significantly higher rate of kidney disease than Caucasians, usually about three times higher. And, you know, we make up about 35% of the patients on dialysis. Wow, so, 35%. You know, our diet has a lot to do with it what we eat, what we consume, our vices, so to speak, <laughs> our habits, alcohol, cigarettes, you know, all these factors come into play when you're talking about your kidneys because your kidneys are primarily responsible for getting rid of a lot of these toxins. So there is a genetic predisposition to kidney disease for African-Americans, uh, more so than our Caucasian counterparts. And, and that's a great bearing on why we're so susceptible to the effects of diabetes and blood pressure. Right, right, right. So when, when we do these shows, I all, as you know, I'm a, a certified diabetes educator and a pharmacist. That's uh, my training. And, uh, you know, we do diabetes education and, and outreach all over the country and, and abroad. We're actually doing, step, doing some work in the Caribbean as well. And, you know, the thing about diabetes is everybody needs to know their numbers. I always like to throw that in. So we want your blood right, sugar right. to be, um, if you have diabetes, we want your blood sugar in the morning to be between 90 and 130. We want your A1C right. to be 7 to 7.5, depending upon your age and your complications. Right. And if you have high blood pressure, we want that blood pressure to be 130 over 80. So I'm sure you have a lot of right. patients that come to your office that don't have those numbers. Yes. Right, right. And that's the biggest challenge. Earlier, you mentioned prevention. That's one of our primary areas where we focus and emphasize in our practice, prevention, prevention, prevention. We've done church seminars. We've done healthcare seminars. When we first opened up, we had a cooking class. Where we actually will have a healthy cooking class that my staff will do on Fridays at 12 to show our patients how to cook how to be healthy so that you can prevent from getting kidney disease. Mm -hmm. But once you get diabetes and blood pressure, knowing what's going on with your body is so important. Oh, yeah. Because no matter what happens, you got to live with the consequences of what happens to your body. If you have a stroke, you got to look in the mirror every day. If you end up on dialysis, this is something that you're going to have to deal with. So knowing your body is so critical yeah. to living a healthy yeah. life. I get on the men so much, Dr. Coleman, because this is the question I ask. Right. How much money you spend on changing your oil? Right. How much do you spend money you spend on washing your car, changing the windshield wipers? Now you spend all this money on this car and you can go buy another car anytime, but this body, this is the only body you got to live in. So you should take care of it like it's worth a million bucks because it is. Exactly. It exactly. really is. It's the only body we have to live in. So I wish we could just get to the point where we start treating our bodies like it is the temple right. of God. Yeah, It's the temple yeah. that you must take care of, and that will get people into more of a preventive mindset. Yeah, I agree. You know, to prevent yeah. a lot of these health care disparities. Because, yeah, there's poverty. Yeah, there's health care, lack of access. But at the end of the day, you're in control of in control. how you take care of your body. You know, yeah. and that is yeah. so critical. You know, I, at Healing Our Village, we really focus on talking to people about them making choices. You know, healthy living is Amen. a choice. So, you know, right. I, I, right. I'm trying to lose weight. I, uh, you know, I'm one of those COVID-19 20 pound weight gain, just like everybody else in the country, <laughs> right? So about yeah. maybe four weeks ago, I said, hey, you know what, done. So all of the things that I teach my patients, I'm actually incorporating and, and doing. And see, right. you know, a lot of us know what to do, 
And it's not not right. necessarily about knowing what to do. Okay, we know we're That's not supposed right. to eat no Kentucky Fried, the whole box of Kentucky Fried Chicken. We exactly. know we're not supposed to fill our plates up and then go back and fill them up again. We know that. We know right. that. Right. But it's right. not about That's knowing right. necessarily. It's about actually yeah. putting these things into action. And you right. mentioned something right. earlier about like, you know our lifestyle, sort of our habits. Right. So those right. are the risk factors that we talk about for kidney disease. So uh -huh. what are some of those risk factors that we can stop yeah. doing that will help us? Great question. Diabetes is the number one risk factor for kidney disease. If you're diabetic, you probably should be seen by a kidney doctor at some point in time yeah. just to try to evaluate your kidneys. Yeah. High blood pressure, the number two cause of kidney disease. The number three cause of kidney disease is glomerulonephritis. But interestingly, in blacks age 18 to 64, HIV is the third most common cause of kidney disease. Wow. So in a, in a young black person who coming into my office, with kidney disease, I'm screening for blood blood pressure and diabetes, but I'm also screening for HIV wow, because that's a, the third most common cause of HIV in that population. So outside of that, smoking is a risk factor right. for uh, kidney disease. Um, obesity is also a risk factor for diabetes, for kidney disease. I said diabetes, but Obesity is the number one risk factor for, diabe for diabetes, yes. too. So the obesity and of course, is the diabetes, diabetes, which leads to the kidney disease, yes. Exactly. So, you know, family history, you know, usually one thing leads to another. I tell patients, you cannot pick your parents. No. So you have no control over your color, your race, and your genetics. But yeah. you do have control over your weight, your habits, your smoking, alcoholism, and things like that. You have a, a human a huge con ability to control what happens in your everyday lifestyle. Yep. And that's what it boils down to. I get asked this question a lot, Dr. Cole. Does coffee affect my kidneys? Yes. Does tea affect my kidneys? Right. And this is what I say. I said, you know, or the sodas affect my kidneys. I said, you know, coffee is not going to destroy your kidneys. Tea is not going to destroy your kidneys. But I said, sodas, Sodas are just not good for anybody. No. Whether you're diabetic, whether you're blood pressure, whether you're kidney disease, they're just not good for you. Will one soda hurt you? No, it won't. No. But the course of, you know, three or four sodas in a day, over the course of 10 years, now we're talking about trouble. Right. You know, we're right. talking and about. that's because it has sodium in it. People don't so, know that it has sodium, a lot of sodium. Yeah, um, I had a right. patient that called me up that's part of our um, our prevention program. Um, they weigh 400 pounds. Uh -huh. I'm trying to wow. get him, yeah. I'm trying to get him that's on great. the straight and narrow. So my first appointment uh -huh. with him is coming up this week. And I said, I told right. him some things to do. And the first thing I said was stop drinking your calories. Right. That's right. You have That's to drink exactly right. water. You have to, you can use flavored water. There's some carbonated flavored waters out there, but right. zero right. calories, low salt is what we're looking at. So you're so right. right. That's so right. important. So everybody has to focus mm -hmm. on that. So now let's say I, a doc, a patient comes to you. What diagnostic tests do you run to sort of see what the health of their kidneys are? Typically the first test that we check is a serum creatinine. That's a blood test, you know, and that test gives us an indication of how well your kidneys are doing. You know, the creatinine is important, but it's not very, I would say, sensitive because it depends on your age, your body size, your weight and all this. And that number, that creatinine, we use it to predict the percentage of what your kidneys are doing. For instance, 100 is normal and that creatinine can give us a, an idea if you're normal or not, but it also can tell us if your kidney function is lower than that. And so that's the first test. The other thing, that's what we call the GFR, the estimated GFR, which stands for glomerular filtration rate. And I just tell my patient, that's a percentage of how well your kidneys are doing. 100% is normal, you know, 60% uh, or less, we consider stage three. If it's 30 to 60, if it's 15 to 30, we're considered to have stage four kidney disease. 
If it's less than 15, it's stage five kidney disease, which is basically when you have to go on dialysis. So that creatinine gives us a, a ton of information about what's going on with your kidneys. And that, if I had one test to check in my patients, that's the one test that I would check because it tells me a lot what's going on with their kidneys. Right. Also the urine, I also check urine to see if there's any protein, any blood or anything else that may be contributing to their kidney disease or that may be a side effect of having abnormal blood pressure or uncontrolled diabetes. So those are the main tests we order usually. Okay, yeah. So you got your serum creatinine, which is a blood test. Mm -hmm. And if your right. kidneys aren't working, that serum creatinine starts to rise. But it's not quite as good and specific as what they call the EGFR, which stands for glomerular right. filtration rate. So that basically right. is how right. well your kidneys are filtering those toxins right. and those wastes, right, out of the body right. into right. the urine. Now, African exactly. Americans sometimes have a different EGFR than Caucasians. Is that is that true? Right. So if you check, for instance, the creatinine in, in say, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaquille O'Neal's creatinine may be really high because he weighs over 300 pounds. He has more body mass. He has more muscle mass. And blacks used to have a higher muscle mass and body mass than, than, you know, Caucasians or other nationalities. So our GFR uh, estimations will be different than our Caucasians. So we have to take that into consideration when we're calculating these numbers and not just take it for what it is. Also for a really, really old individual, we have to take into consideration the age when we get these numbers. Uh -huh. And also for a person who's really, really overweight, you mentioned a guy 400 pounds, you know, a 400 pound man is really hard to draw their creatinine and have an accurate prediction of what their kidney function is or what their kidneys are filtering because he's so large. So in a guy like that, we do what we call a 24 hour urine and a 24 hour urine can give us a, a real estimated GFR or a real GFR, not an estimated, but an actual GFR. So that's kind of why we look at African Americans or extremes of weight differently than other patients, yes. you know, because there is a difference in muscle mass and it does have a prediction on what your GFR may be. And so, you know, normal for African Americans is greater than 60%. Right. A normal estimated GFR is greater than 60. And if the patient comes in, the GFR is greater than 60. Usually they have a low risk of developing chronic kidney disease or going on dialysis. Right. So that's what we look for to help us predict what's going to happen in this patient over the next five to 10 years. And I use that information to try to convince the patients to eat right, you know, stop drinking their calories, stop doing a lot of things that will push them into a worse kidney stage. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So these numbers are very helpful in helping us predict this information. Yeah. Now you also mentioned um, albumin, which is basically uh -huh. a, a protein that is, you know, is in the body. And if right. your kidneys are damaged, mm -hmm. that, that you start to potentially spill this protein into the urine. So you're measuring that because right. it really is a measure of sort of kidney damage. So anyone right. with diabetes right. and even hypertension, but diabetes for sure, right. it's actually required right. that the, their doctors mm -hmm. are checking their albumin in their urine right. Right. and so when you go yep. see your doctor you need to say hey doc what was my albumin and it needs to be albumin? urinary albumin it needs to be less than 30. so when you hit that right. 30 number then that means you, you need to really start trying to do things to decrease the spilling of albumin into the urine right yeah you're exactly right the nephrons which are the little small cells in the kidney they have something called a glomerular basement membrane and basically, it's like a, if you think of it like a filter, it's like a filter. Albumin filters through, but only so much albumin should filter through into the urine. Right. If there's too much albumin filtering into the urine, that automatically tells us there's something wrong with the kidneys. There's something damaging the kidneys that's causing this filter to basically be large and allowing too much albumin 
to filter through those little slit pores is what we call them. And usually we see that in patients who have uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled blood pressure, right. or some other type of kidney disease that has damaged that filter and the albumin in the urine starts to creep up. And we can see that and we can measure that and we can follow the urine albumin to give us an indication what's going on at the level of the kidneys or at the level of these filters. So patients should always ask their doctor, what's the albumin, what's my creatinine, what's my GFR, and write it down. Yeah, you know, down. Make, a, make a chart of what's going on with your body because at the end of the day, you're going to have to live with the consequences of what happens. Exactly. You know, your exactly. doctor and the medical providers can only do so much. Right. Too much responsibility is placed on us medical providers. Yeah. And we, you only see us once every three months. Yeah. You, we, we got a snapshot window of time with you. Whereas, you know, I told one of my patients, I said, I'm not going to go home with you and, and slap your hand every time you get ready to eat some fried chicken. <laughs> okay. I can't I'm do it. I'm not going to do that. No. But you can be basically your own healthcare advocate, you right. know? and be responsible there are so many resources out there for our patients just yes diabetes and they're, not using, them. And they're not using them right so talk to and, me about so, symptoms so what symptoms do symptoms. you see when patients come in and they and so that what things do they say to you that say oh wow you know i need yeah. to check your kidneys yeah a lot of times you will see fluid retention which that could almost mean anything too much salt too much ibuprofen but a lot of times it can mean kidney disease. So that's something that I see a lot in my practice. When the kidneys start failing, you can see nausea, you can see vomiting, you can see poor appetite. You can see uh, what we call dysgeusia, which means your food just don't taste right. People oh, say my okay. food tastes like rust. It tastes like metal. So we see that. We also see itching. We call it pruritus. It just means that sometimes your phosphorus levels and toxins will build up in your system and your kidneys aren't getting rid of it. So you start itching. So that's something that we see a lot. Fatigue, tiredness, weakness. I just don't have to get up and go like I used to. Uh, I had one patient call me and she was at stage five kidney disease. And she called and said, Dr. Hall, I cannot get out of the bed this morning. <laughs> oh. I cannot get out of bed. So she was so tired, so weak. I said, well, lady, Come on, we're going to start you on dialysis. We already knew she, she was pre-end stage renal disease. Right. So that was my key. We have to get her started. Okay. So, I mean, there are a lot of symptoms because your kidneys do so much. Right. So, you know, many, many symptoms can occur from kidney disease. Yeah. One big one is anemia, low blood count. That's another right. symptom of kidney disease. So we check all this when pa patients come to our clinic. We look for these signs and symptoms so that we can make sure we're honing in on treating them and trying to not miss anything that may be occurring as a result of having kidney disease. Yeah, yeah. so you mentioned the word, yeah. the, the D word, you mentioned the word dialysis. So let's talk yeah. about dialysis. So what exactly yes, is dialysis? Dialysis is a process where we remove toxins from your body. There is a misconception that some that dialysis will actually help your kidneys improve. And I tell patients that is not what dialysis does. Dialysis does nothing for your kidneys. Dialysis does what your kidneys should be doing. So what is that? Removing toxins from your system, removing fluid from your system, uh, removing waste from your system. And you know there are several types of dialysis. There's hemodialysis that involves taking blood running it through a machine, cleaning it, and then putting it back in your system. Okay. That does what your kidneys should be doing. Right. Uh, it also removes calcium and phosphorus and sodium and all this other stuff. And then there's peritoneal dialysis, which involves using your peritoneal cavity as a, quote, membrane to remove toxins from your system. So that's another type of dialysis. So dialysis is... You know, it can be done in a center where you go and get hooked to the machine, or you can do it at home. Okay. Home dialysis patients, I'm going to put a plug in for home dialysis. 
home dialysis patients do better because okay. There's, okay. there's more independence, there's more autonomy, and quality of life is better. And there's so much more, I guess you would say, um, self care. And you have to have stake in the game. So there's a lot more attention to the details in patients who are on home dialysis. So those patients do so much better than some of our patients who go to a dialysis unit because they feel like I can just let them do everything and I can eat what I want to eat. I've had patients tell me, man, I can eat what I want to eat. I'm on dialysis now. I said, no, you can't eat what you no, want to eat. <laughs> that is not the That's answer not we true. need. That's not true. So there's a lot of misconceptions. And I found Dr. Coleman that my biggest job is probably educate. Yeah. You know, yeah. I got to do the nephrologist stuff. But honestly, educating is what I do more than anything else. Exactly. So now how many times a week should people get dialysis? <laughs> you know, the hemodialysis is three times a week. If you're done in a center, that's four hours. So that's about 12 hours. Okay. Patients who do a home dialysis usually get about 16 hours or 20 hours. A lot of them dialyze five hours for four weeks. So they okay. may get 20 hours a week. If you're on peritoneal dialysis, which is using your abdominal cavity as a membrane, those patients dialyze every day. Okay. So they dialyze seven days a week. Most of them do it at night while they're sleeping. And because it's more physiologic, more similar to your own kidney and own body's processes, those patients get more dialysis over time. Okay. So the more dialysis, the better, and they do better. Okay, okay. And then what about diet? Is there certain diets or certain things they should or should not eat that you tell them? Yes, most patients are fluid sensitive right. because your kidneys aren't, you know, causing you to urinate all the fluid out of your system so you need to monitor your fluid intake that's the biggest thing you need to monitor some of the other things is potassium because your kidneys are the main organ that gets rid of potassium we put patients on a low potassium diet the other thing is phosphorus you know your kidneys are the main organ that eliminates phosphorus from your body so we put them on a low phosphorus diet okay. so foods that are low in phosphorus we recommend foods that are high in phosphorus you know, we kind of disencourage patients from eating those foods, such as, you know, uh, a lot of bread products, dark sodas, uh, potatoes, and things of that nature. Um, some of the other things, sodium, is is causes you to be causes you to retain fluid. Right. Blacks are salt sensitive, so our black patients or African American patients, we heavily encourage them to decrease the sodium intake to less than 2,000 milligrams a day right. because of the fluid retention aspect of it. So all dialysis units have a dietitian on staff, and all of our patients have to meet with them when they first initiate dialysis, but also monthly, you know, and kind of basically see where we are on our diet and our intake and our numbers. So your diet will not just be liberated when you get on dialysis. No. That's a misconception. <laughs> Access the other way around. Your diet will be probably more scrutinized even more when you get on dialysis. Yeah, so that's kind of what we were talking about that with our patients. You know, one of the things that uh, um, I'm not too keen on is all these high protein diets, the keto uh -huh. diet, and all these high. That, the, right. If you're predisposed to kidney disease, those probably are not super good diets for you to be on. That's right. Right. We tell our patients you need to be on a normal protein diet. Normal protein. If you if you're not on dialysis, eat a normal protein diet because right. that's going to keep your body well nourished, and and you won't get, become malnourished, and you won't overload your kidneys with excess protein. Right. However, when you get on dialysis, because patients are, you know, usually malnourished on dialysis to some degree. We push protein in these patients to try to improve their nutritional status. Right. You know, they did okay. a study on dialysis patients and their nutritional level. And believe it or not, obese dialysis patients live longer. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> patients with, you know, albumin levels that were normal or high did better. 
because they were well nourished. I see. You know, there was no malnutrition in those places. So it will change. Your eating um, protocol will change once you get on dialysis. But at the end of the day, you just want to try to eat healthy. That's you know, it. just eat healthy. Like your mama always told you, eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables. <laughs> eat your vegetables. You can't go wrong with eating your vegetables. No, you so, can't. You can't. That was listen, a great so what do you question. tell your male patients? I'm sure they ask you, is yeah. kidney disease going to affect my sex life? Is there anything they need yeah. to think about as it relates to that? <laughs> that's always yeah, that's a question, a right? Question. Oh, and you know, Dr. Coleman, the women never ask that question. No. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> never ask that question. So, you know, honestly, you know, I'm going to backtrack a little. Blood pressure affects your your libido, your sex drive, blood pressure medicines affect your libido, uh, diabetes affects your libido. You know, out of those three, you know, diabetes is probably the worst because yeah. it affects your vasculature. Anything that's going to affect your your blood flow to your penis is going to affect your libido. And so, you know, patients who are men and diabetic, that's one of my selling tools to get your A1C below seven. Is this going to affect your libido? So you need to work on it now before it affects it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so that's one of my selling things. Blood pressure medicines, almost all of them affect it also. But, you know, I tell my patients, if you have a stroke, nothing's going to work. Right. The libido is not going to work. No. Your arm may not work. You may have a feeding tube. So I use a lot of this as selling tools to our men patients. Because kidney disease, especially late stage kidney disease, affects your sex drive also. Yes. And when you get on dialysis, you're tired, you're weak, you don't have a lot of stamina, and so you kind of that your sex drive gets affected. And so a lot of patients have to get on Levitra, Viagra, Cialis, which is okay in our patient populations. You know, if you have heart problems or take any certain heart medicine like nitrates. You can't take the uh, Levitra and Viagra medicines, right. but if you just don't dialysis, and you don't have those other heart conditions, you can take them and do fine, and they will help you in that area. I mean, it is a medical condition. You know, thank God we have medicines for that particular disease. But, you know, if you don't smoke, if you eat right, you keep your weight under control, and you really take care of your health, most men will not have problems in that area okay. and and that area will work fine but you know you just have to kind of be proactive you know so that you won't develop any areas any problems in that area of your life so, just so that's kind of what because we we're, we're getting ready to get the, the wrap up here but i just wanted you to say just okay. a few things about the medications that you see with when you're uh, with your patients right um when they come in um, uh, what, what, what can they do? But you know what? Hold off on that, on that answer. I'm going to do a short break. They just said that I needed to have everybody stand. Epigallocatechin gallate, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, now those are names you probably aren't familiar with, but you should be. Those are antioxidants known to fight free radicals. In fact, did you know that some viruses are actually alcohol resistant? One major study showed that by adding the epigallocatechins from green tea, it killed the virus on contact. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm here to share with you an exciting new technologically advanced patent pending green tea hand sanitizing wash from Handout Protection. Now, this is not your typical hand gel designed to just smear all over your hands. This is a hand washing sanitizer to cover your entire hand, both the front and back of your hand in between your fingers and your wrist. This is a non-sticky sanitizing hand wash designed for convenience to take with you in your purse, pocket, or carry in your lunchbox. 
As Dr. Josh Ridge has stated, what goes on your body goes into your body. That is why we choose only the highest FDA compliant ingredients, such as 75% isopropyl alcohol, an organic green tea brewed with alkaline water. The only way to protect yourself and your family is to always carry a disposable package of handout with you. This may be the only handout you ever need. Smoke. Hi, hi. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we had a, a short break and, and we're here today talking about chronic kidney disease. This is for your health. I'm Dr. Lenore Coleman, president and founder of Healing Our Village, and this is Kidney Month. March is Kidney Month, and so we are honored to have Dr. James Hall for those who are just now tuning in. And we have been talking about chronic kidney disease. So, Dr. Hall, I, before break, we, I asked you to talk a little bit about the medication. So, just give us a, just an overview, real, you know, real okay. brief. And then we're going to do another episode this month where we do a deep dive on the medication. So, just okay. when people come okay. to you, what, what do you see they're on? What medicines shouldn't yeah. they be on? That kind of thing. Right, right. Oh, that's a great question. Typically, we try to tailor our medicines to each individual patient based on their needs. You know, if they have high blood pressure, we focus on that and we use the angiotensin receptor blockers to help with blood pressure like Valsart and Divan, Benicar. If they're, um, for instance, have fluid in their legs, we try to go towards a diuretic like a fluid pill, like Lasix or hydrochlorothiazide or something like that to try to get rid of some of the fluid in their body. You know, so, and if they got like low potassium, we'll put on a medicine that'll help raise the potassium. Or if they got a high potassium, we'll put on a medicine that'll help lower the potassium. So we look at their numbers and we look at things that may be going on individually and we tailor our medicines based on their needs. If their diabetes is high, we put them on something that's going to lower the sugar and help the kidneys. Right. So, so there's a plethora of medicine that we use and we try to tailor it to each patient based on what their body may be calling for at the time. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's good. That's so a good. those so kind of some so of the main agents. A, uh, a deep dive on the medications on our, our next for your health session this month, but I want, I know you've got patients and you're, and you took your time out today to, to talk to us. Thank you yes, so much for coming to yes, talk to, for you. us on for your health. And uh, again, you're in Brookhaven, Mississippi. Yes, right. you have your right. practice yes. there, and you have a dialysis center as well. So, patients, right. if you right. know, I, I'm, I'm giving you a resource. He's he's there in Mississippi. <laughs> so, give him a call. Right. Get in there so you can get some good care. Thank you so much That's for right. coming today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me, Doctor Coleman. All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye bye.